Thanks for staying with us here on The Real Story. For today's committee close-up, we have the Education Committee with us right now. Democratic co-chair Senator Douglas McCrory and Republican ranking member Senator Eric Berthel. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So we're doing these committee close-ups where we're bringing uh, members on, co-chairs on, and talking about some of the bills that um, have already been submitted. And we were just saying this too, it's important <laughs> to note that this is the very early stages of the legislative process. So members will uh, write these bills, submit the bills, and then that's when the committee starts and gets to work and, and starts wading through them to see what has support. So exactly. we know one of the biggest issues uh, last year as well as this year is managing the pandemic and the learning loss that's occurred because of it. So I know that that's going to be probably a main issue that you all are going to be tackling. Uh, Senator McCrory, I want to start with you. What's the biggest thing that you all are going to be looking at and hoping to accomplish? Well, um, again, thanks for having us here. Well, you know, this year is going to be exciting. There's a lot of things. I know um, COVID has impacted us tremendously, right? We saw that, me personally, I'm a 33-year educator, and we saw the learning loss that our children had um, during COVID and how it impacted us. And some communities is more pronounced because they were already lost that, that they were having. So the fact that we have an opportunity now with this COVID issue has just enlightened, enlightened what we already had knew. So it's hard is managing that. We know a lot of our teachers are burned out. Um, they experience a lot of stress during COVID. COVID, and what what really is happening is we're losing them, and we're losing a lot of our teachers because of that. And right now we're in a shortage. There's a shortage, and not just in Connecticut, but there's a shortage across this country mm -hmm. of teachers who are, who have left the profession because of because of COVID. And what we have to do in the state of Connecticut is find ways to recruit more teachers to the state of Connecticut into the industry ourselves or grow our own. So that's that's what a lot, that's a lot of things that we've seen since COVID. I, that's what the major impact. And, and I mean, there's obviously bipartisan support for some of this. I would sure, assume a lot sure. of it um, because uh, the learning losses. Yeah, and I think one of the things that that we've seen and that we are uh, in agreement with as a committee and and with the uh, with the educators is that there's a need to um, and I don't know that we've exactly figured out how to do this yet. We're in the process of that, but there's a need to make assessments as to where these children are. You know, just because someone is is in a child is in the third grade with all of the loss and, and, and the very different ways in which education was delivered during the COVID uh, pandemic when we schools were shut down. We, we really need to make sure that if, if we're going to promote a child out of the third grade to the fourth grade or a senior out into the workforce, which I know we're going to talk a little bit about about that as well today, um, we really should be ensuring that they're ready for uh, for that next grade. And that'll be incumbent upon uh, upon the, uh, the you know, the many uh, talented administrators administrators and teachers that are out uh, across Connecticut to uh, examine that and uh, and uh, and identify what's going on in their respective schools. I know we just actually had a full screen up that was talking about this Department of Education's spring report and some of the results that they saw, you know, lowest percentage of ninth graders on track to graduate, 7% increase in chronic absenteeism. I mean, these are major issues yeah. um, that that's impacting our future here in Connecticut. Absolutely, and I want to piggyback on what my colleagues say, um, being assessed properly. You know, one of the biggest issues in education we have is the fact that a lot of our children are, are, are coming out of third grade not able to read on grade level. Um, it's been an issue that's been going on for a long time in the state of Connecticut, um, and we put forth some legislation, the Right to Read bill, that we might have to modify a little bit, because at the end of the day, you know, we always say that um, education is a great equalizer, but it's not if it's not the education is not equal. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that in too many cases in too many school districts, we are losing a lot of our children at an early age because they're not reading by third grade. And even when we get to a high school level, yeah. um, we of course we want all our kids to go on to college and those things, but everyone's not might not want to go on to college. And we have to provide avenues or opportunities for people who want to go into the trades mm -hmm. um, and make it easier or not easier but more uh, acceptable for children who don't want to go on to college, might want to go on to the workforce. So we're going to do a lot of things around workforce and getting people who are in those industries, finding a way to get them back into our classrooms and give them that on-hand support so that can be an industry that a lot of our children, our young people want to go into. You want to go into workforce yeah, development so I with would, that? I, I think what uh, Senator McCrory said is exactly right. And the only thing I would add to that is that we have been approached, uh, legislators throughout the General Assembly have been approached by uh, the industries that exist in our districts, the, uh, you know, the trades, the manufacturing. You know, Connecticut is rich 
with uh, with manufacturing jobs that are support, uh, supporting uh, aerospace, aeronautics, uh, you know, just just uh, good old fashioned manufacturing of, of of things, you know, here in Connecticut. And one of the things that that we have been asked by these companies to do is to get children that are in high school workforce ready. Not every kid is going to go to college. Not every kid is is wants to go to college. These employers are telling us we need talent coming out. There are 100,000 jobs open in Connecticut right now. Many of them are highly skilled labor. They're great paying jobs. Kids that go into these jobs, children that go and graduate high school that go into these jobs can end up with, with really good careers, making, making really livable wages and stay in Connecticut, right. which is very, Connecticut's right. expensive. We, we acknowledge that right. and they can stay. But we have, a, we have an opportunity to partner public part, private partnerships with many manufacturers and companies Companies to uh, bring this to fruition and do some really great things. Better? As I'm listening to my colleague he talk about expenses to live in Connecticut, that's another issue we have with teachers. Yeah. They can't afford to live in the communities that they work. So we have a housing issue that our teachers have to uh, we have to address to if we want to keep and retain our teachers. Another thing is a, a huge um, hot ticket item this year is going to be the ECS. Mm -hmm. And are we full, are we going to fully fund education? I think that is very important that that the community out there know what ECS is yeah. and how we fund education. There are so many different ways we fund, whether you go to a techno school, a math school, a charter school, there's so many different ways. What we're going to have on February 1st is a town hall discussion. We're going to have a public hearing to teach the public what does ECS mean and how what this change mean for their community. So mm -hmm. I want to say this personally and I know I'm an educator yep. and, and I believe uh, money is important. Mm -hmm. When it comes to educating our children, I think uh, we need to pay teachers a great salary. Um, and I'm, I'm not against putting more money into a pot, but they have, we also have to have accountability, right? So if we're going to add, if we're looking to add more money to a pot, to a, a system that's not working very well for all children, we're going to have to also have to have some accountability measures built in. How do you do that? So that and, and, you know, and that's a very good point. We have to write legislation to make sure to ensure that our children are doing certain things at a certain time. And one of the things I also want to say, and you can go back to the, the um, ECS issue, that we need all the research in the world shows that all children learn better if they're taught by a diverse teaching population. Mm -hmm. We know that. We know in Connecticut, um, only 9% of the teachers are, are teachers of color. And one of the issues are is that we have to find a way to recruit more people of color into the field of education, especially men. Because the research says that, especially for so black and brown children, mm -hmm. young, young men, the data shows that if they have one teacher of color in elementary school, the chances of them dropping out tremendously drop. The chances of them applying for college increases. So one of the programs we have already, and we want to add more resources to it, is what we call our teacher's residency program. Right. And what we're finding, we can get more people into the industry, not through the traditional way of going mm -hmm. through a four-year university, but they might come from a different sector of education. They might come from a different, they might already work in a school. They might be a, a coach. They might be doing something else. We have created programs to get them into our classrooms. And we're, that's one of the big things we're doing. I just want to put a plug for this event that's coming up Sure, on February 2nd, February 2nd at the Yargo Look Stadium, right here. we have an event called Calling Men of Color Mix and Mingle. Come learn about how you men can get into our classrooms and help educate our children because like I said, all children learn better when they are taught by a diverse teacher population and in Connecticut, the, the percentage of men of color teaching is less than two. Wow, and I, know, I remember actually doing a real story with you. It was remote because it was during the pandemic. You came mm. on and you talked about that program. Right. So are you looking to also increase funding for that? Yes, okay. ab absolutely. I mean, this year, I mean, the good thing about um, um, where we are in the state of Connecticut, we have resources, we have funds, we have money. Right, and, and money right now especially right now so it's time for us to resource up those programs we know that work that can actually change the lives for all our children in the future and I look I'll, I'll I agree with everything that, that my uh, esteemed colleague has said and I have been proud over you know I've been in the legislature now my ninth year and I think every year Doug that you and I have worked together on the Education Committee I've been proud to co-sponsor and or introduce bills regarding minority teacher recruitment Connecticut's demographic has changed a lot over from 
from when he and I, Doug and I, are about the same age, literally. Same age, actually, same and, uh, age. We were just talking about we, you know, when from, from the time when he and I were in elementary school and right. in, in, in grade school, the demographic of Connecticut has changed. Our education system and the people who are delivering education, our teachers and administrators, should change with that demographic. And, and it's really wonderful that we have events like this one coming up where we uh, will hopefully attract uh, men of color to come in and teach in our classrooms. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the absolute right thing to do. It helps us to address some of the teacher shortage issues that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And it, it absolutely helps us to make Connecticut even more diverse. I and that's that, a good thing. I think a lot of parents um, you know, realized, if they hadn't already, how important our teachers are during the pandemic. Oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Because you have your kids home and you're trying to teach them. And you realize how, how much a teacher is not just a teacher. Right. It's yeah, a right. coach. It's a cheerleader. Social it's, worker. Yeah, exactly. They, they, they do a so lot many of things. things. And, you know, and, and, and I said that we know teachers got burned out, but it's not just the teachers. It's the social workers in the schools. It's mm -hmm. the guidance counselor. We're losing them also, and we have to create ways of getting them into our school system. The other thing that's, that, that we haven't done in the last 25 years in education in the state of Connecticut, look at our regs review. How we prepare people to go into the classroom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We cannot prepare students to become teachers the way we did back in the 20th century. There's so much new technology. We know social emotional needs have come about. Um, we've got the internet that wasn't applied. So the way we prepare educators to go into, into our classroom, we have to take another look at that and making sure we're putting the right customer in front of our children. Yeah, and that, and that goes to some of what we spoke to a moment ago about workforce development. You know, if we if we truly believe that, and, and we know that, we're not questioning it, we believe that there's a need for more uh, high school age students to get into jobs and trades like plumbing, electrician. Mm -hmm. These jobs are here, and, yeah. and pr pretty soon, uh, you know, medical technicians, even the lodging industry, right, all of these great jobs that are out there that pay living wages, we need to be able to get people who aren't necessarily a traditional educator right. into those classrooms, right. get them in a little bit faster than yep. the traditional process exactly. for training educators, yes. so that if you're, if you're a, uh, a, plumber a plumber that's yeah. about to retire yeah. or a yeah. carpenter, you have yeah. all this lifetime of skills. Yeah. Why not be able to impart that on children right. and convince some some young child right. that go to go into that, that into that trade? Right. Because I those mean, which are quite lucrative. They yeah. are very lucrative yeah. for sure. We have to modify the way we um, prepare teachers. We I do. Mean, how, I, mean, I mean, it can't be just pass this test or check this box. We want to see if you can demonstrate the fact that you can do that. And think about it. You got a plumber in there, and they're and they're and they're in a partnership with another um, right. like veteran teacher. Everyone wins that way. So we have to modify the way we've been traditionally. Right. Have done things when, when we talk about education. I want to make sure we get to this and not to make the, the conversation uncomfortable but this is something that's talked about around the country right now and we're talking about how much um, influence that parents can have on what their kids are taught in school. We know Florida's dealing you know with this right now with what um, Governor DeSantis is doing but explain to people how much influence you all have as a legislature on what gets taught in schools. And that's a hard uh, conversation to say, but well, look, is so, it who, who yeah, actually yeah. does the curriculum? Is, right, it, right. is it the Board of Education? I'm not saying what should happen right now, but right. just so people understand. Right, so we have, we have a State Board of Education, we have a State Department of Education mm -hmm. that work collaboratively. The issues that come before the legislature with respect to curriculum are uh, more, more of the unique mandates, if you will. Right. Like right. We, right. we might want to, we might have, you know, we have these two great tribal nations in, here in yep. Connecticut, yep. And, uh, and Connecticut is a, is a, again, is a is a state uh, rich in uh, in you know Native American uh, history, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know the, our our state name, right? Sure. So uh, we might get a, a request for a mandate to teach American uh, uh, you know Native American studies in in classrooms, yep. and that's really where the legislature gets involved wow. uniquely in yeah. curriculum. We rely upon the State Board of Education and the State Department of Education to mm -hmm. provide us with model curriculum and with the the ideas that that those are the experts. You know, yeah. we're not experts on curriculum design, right? right. Uh, because that's not what we're we're elected right. to do. Right. So right. we're more of the overseers, I yeah, guess. Exactly. Uh, would be the way I would categorize. And, and I say, and, and it, I think it's funny because you, you mentioned Florida was what's going on in Florida. Last year we did something um, um, historic in this country. Um, we, we 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 put an opportunity out there that Black and Latino studies will be required to be offered in the state of Connecticut. Yeah. And we didn't have a problem at all. Everyone, right. I think the the bill passed unanimously. So. 
you know, so we, we're not like other states. This committee works co in collaboration. Yep. I have never had an issue with any of my colleagues on the other side of our, or any of my Absolutely colleagues who might yep. bring forth any type of crazy type of legislation that before us. Like you said, there's a whole lot of bills that's coming in. Right. Probably over 300, 400 bills. Right. At the end of the day, we're probably going to do about eight or nine bills. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's how the process so works. So people put things out, and then, and there are some that are looking at, like, uh, looking at what's being taught in schools and right. stuff. But you all sit there and you go through and you figure out the ones right. that are going to have the most um, support well, as yes. you go through. Exactly. And right now, so to give me your top three that you think this legislative session you're going to be pushing forward. <laughs> oh, top three. Well, I'll tell you what's going to be uh, highlighted. Okay. ECS. Yes. Um, um, that's definitely. Workforce uh, development. Workforce development. Okay. And, and teacher shores. Uh, sure. I'm working on okay. the teacher shores. Yep. And, and within that, diversifying our teacher population. Those are three top ticket items you'll see this year. Okay. Yeah. And, and, because, and because we because we work collaboratively, I, I actually agree 100% with that being our top top three issues. That. Well, let's uh, just do the bills right here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you both so much for thank coming you. on the program and talking about what you thank all you have so much. going Appreciate on. It. Always welcome on The Real Story to vet out some of those issues. Thank you. All right. All right, for more